this work has not been seen in public since. And I want to introduce Masumi Hayashi's son, Dean Kesey, who's come from California with his wife and his daughter, Masumi. But this afternoon, we have Barbara Tannenbaum from the Cleveland Museum, who knew Masumi and is the author of the preface in the book and has graciously agreed to just chat a little about this work. So thank you for coming, Barbara. Why do I know? So um, today I just really want to talk, since how many people know Masumi and knew her work? Or and or knew her work? Yeah. So I thought instead of going to the basics, which most of you probably know, that I just would talk a little bit about an aspect of Masumi's art that's not really covered as much in the essay in the book, which hopefully many of you have read or will read, but instead um, talk about how she considered the photograph as a physical object rather than an image. And a lot of you, um, nowadays, we are all very much exposed to photographs in many different forms, but mostly, you know, volumetrically on the pages of a book or on our screens, on our computer screen, on our cell phone screen, where it is always an image. And in fact, in the screen, it's totally, um, there's incarnate, there's no body to it. It's just pixels. And on um, the pages of a book, it's a reproduction. And it's a very different experience for Masumi's work to look at it in person. And we have that opportunity and that pleasure today, so I thought we'd take advantage of it. Um, a lot of times, a lot of artists, you can look at the image in a book, and it's not that different from looking. In fact, in the 30s and the 40s and even the 50s, the hallmark of success as a photographer was not a gallery show. It was to be on the pages of Life magazine in every coffee table in America. But that was a reproduction. That was edited and cropped by a photo editor. And Masumi, by making these kinds of physical objects that are both A, collages, and B, very large scale, require that they be seen in person to understand and experience them. And that's a very different attitude towards photography. It's one that um, she started making them in the 80s, and it's, it's an attitude that sort of came to life in the seven, late 70s and early 80s, where artists began to make bigger and bigger photographs. And if we start to look at even some of the images here, um, like the stadium, first of all, you're very, oops, is everybody okay? Um, yeah, well, there is a physical aspect to these, so physical activity. Um, I think it's more moving in and out than up and down. But, um, and so here, for instance, you're very aware of the fact that this is made up of individual components. You see the grid lines. And that's true of a lot of her work. And some of them, when you step back, you can sort of dissolve them. But in many of them, they're actually very insistent. And so you're aware immediately that it's made of individual components that have been assembled together to make a whole. So instead of the image that you have, say you think of a Halsman portrait of somebody leaping. I mean, that's really a gestalt. You get the image in one second. You can't do that with this work, both because of the individual components and because of that combination of perspective, that it is warping time and space. Um, it's really interesting to me that each of the components, um, she used a commercial printer and she had them done in either four by six or five by seven. Usually there's one or two that are larger, but um, and that's really snapshot size. That's your home, you know, you tend to take a photograph, you used to send it out to the drugstore or to the photo processor and you would get it back. It's that little sort of intimate memory moment. But it's turned into something that really becomes a social memory, that becomes a societal memory instead. So the basic building blocks, the units, are these images, the size of image and the color photograph which those of us of a certain generation expect to have our, you know, family picnic, our family reunion, um, you know, baby's first steps, whatever. And yet it becomes part of this very monumental, very grand whole. And then with the warping of the perspective, um, you know, you need to sort of move back and forth to get a sense of these because when you see them from a distance, you read a certain, um, like let's move to this one, in order to understand it, you have to come close and start piecing together what is like, in other words, what's behind you, what's in front of you, what is your perspectival angle, because it isn't a single one. 
And as you start looking, this probably isn't the best one, one of the Indian ones, but that room is too small, but don't miss it. There's great, um, some of the sacred architecture and the later series are in the back room. And they're really beautiful, but it's a little small for a group our size. Um, but as you look around, in the images that have people in them or that have daylight, and you can begin to follow the shadows, you begin to realize that these are discrete moments. And they don't, they all may belong to this, but they are not that moment. So we normally believe in photography as capturing a moment, as a slice of time, but this is many different slices of time put together by the artist, combined and warping time and warping space. So, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar, she would set up her camera and a tripod. She had a, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, like a, um, a numbered dial, basically. And she would move it so many degrees on the dial. Um, so she would take a shot on one plane. So she would do the horizon level first, start in the center, move to the right. Come back to the center, move to the left. Go one notch up, sort of, do the same thing and repeat it. So it might take her two, three, four hours to make a photograph. During that time, light, if you're outdoors, light is changing. If you're indoors, but there are people around, they're moving around. In fact, there's one of her images, I don't think it's one of the ones that's here, where you can see the same people in the image at either end. And they've moved, they've you know, done other things. And so it is a combination of times and moments. And it is a combination of spaces that is not our normal looking out, you know, sort of building that rectangle from your vision. In fact, it is this panorama where she's moving around. So when you look at these objects, when you walk up close to them, they almost start to surround you in the same way that the space would. And so that also is an integral component in terms of relating physically to these. And um, as you can see from some of the earlier super fun sites, she started smaller and got bigger and bigger and bigger, and especially got more horizontal. And that is because it does wrap around you in that way, and it emulates that experience. But it's an experience that you cannot grasp in a single look. You must build it together yourself out of those components in order to understand what you're looking at and what you're seeing. Um, and so we'll just finish off in the last room where these singular components end up repeated so that the logic of the documentary photo is ruptured. The logic of space is ruptured. And I love this one of Watts Towers. First of all, it's a place I've always wanted to go and never have, but I feel in a way I've experienced it through Masumi. But also, she, she puts her own shadow in there, and you can see that it ends up in two different images, that space and time are brought together, and what should be a logical supporting structure becomes these bits of reinforcement, these um, rods floating in the sky. So she's disrupting our normal logic and forcing the viewer to participate with this both as a physical object and as a mental construct. So it's not something that is um, readily understandable, it's something that forces you to spend time. Just as she spent time photographing it and then reconstructing it in the studio, um, her aim was not to make a synchronous whole, it was to make a dyssynchronous whole. It was to make something that reflected her experience of the space and her understanding of time and space as a photographer. And she talks a lot about the image starting with really the, she found the words, but she was doing the practice earlier, the panopticon. When she started doing the prison series, she became familiar with um, the philosopher Foucault's idea of the panopticon, which is in prisons, um, the prison is arranged around you and there's one guy in the center. It's a way for one person to keep an eye on many different people. All, you know, with a, a, an economy of manpower to su surveil and to supervise a number of different people. And that um, idea of Foucault carried over into society, and that we lived in an increasingly, and still true, a surveilled society. And so um, she began to talk about that after she did the prisons and, and encountered the Foucault essay. But really, even before that, she was working with this sense of the panorama and the fact that it's one person's very subjective viewpoint, hers. So she's controlling, you know, we control the horizontal, we control the vertical. The old um, 
right. Twilight Zone, yeah, yeah, on TV. Well, she's controlling the horizontal. She's controlling the vertical. She's controlling time. She's controlling space. So it's really the artist as being somebody who is um, omnipotent for that in that one physical object in that time over over the physical world and the rules of, of physics and time as we experience them. So it's her ability to express her subjective presence and it's very much um, I think about that um, single viewpoint and as I do say in the essay you know she ha was very aware of the fact that hers was um, an individual and unique viewpoint in that she was very aware of being a woman in a male-dominated society um, in male-dominated academia, in a male-dominated art world. She was very aware of being an Asian-American, a Japanese-American, in a society in which she was born in a concentration camp here. Her parents were among those people who were interned, and she was born there. So she was very aware of that difference and how it set her off. She grew up in Watts, in a largely black community, and became president of her high school class. Um, you know, she was truly the minority in that school. And so she was very aware of the ways that her particular experience set her aside and gave her an individual viewpoint. And she's very um, expressive in using it to approach different subjects, um, many of which are autobiographical, if you think about it. Because her experience with Cleveland, with the Rust Belt, with um, prisons, um, her interest in prisons, and finally ending up with the Sacred Architecture series, where she found a kind of peace and um, spiritual um, bond in Asia when she went to visit temples. So in a way the show itself is an autobiography and I encourage you to make sure you see all of it and explore it and think of it that way. Thank you very much. Thank you. For technical questions we have Michael here. So, so that's very helpful. <laughs> I have one technical question. Yeah. So it's my understanding that there, there wasn't this one photo. There were four or five that captured that frame. And then when she assembled them, she chose what, she took it at different um, stops. Stop. So Sometimes, yeah. yeah. Well, she would bracket every, in the days of film, everybody bracketed. Okay. There was no no brack, non bracketing. So it might be that there was, for this rectangle, for instance, as white a background as that, but she chose the. But there might not have been. Because when she was photographing these, it might have been full sun, and the rest of it was clouds, because it takes place over time. So I think that if she had a choice, she might be making that purposeful expression of the passage in, of time. In, in, in photographing it, but I think on the assembly, in the assembly of it. No, and that's when she was choosing. Yeah. Okay. That's when she's making that purposeful choice. Could you just explain what bracketing is real quick? Oh yeah, bracketing is when, back in the days of film, when you couldn't really manipulate the image all that well, um, photographers would almost always shoot um, a half f-stop and maybe even a full f-stop um, more open and a half f-stop and a full f-stop sometimes uh, more closed down lens so that you were sure that you got a proper exposure. Because looking through the viewfinder, you got no sense of what the exposure was and people wouldn't use light meters, but it was an inexact science except for people who thought, like Ansel Adams, that they could pre-visualize everything in the world. But, um, so that's what bracketing is, is that most people doing jobs or photographing for any kind of serious purpose would um, do a multiplicity of exposures. Um, the, whatever the light meter read or their camera read or they thought was right, they would uh, insure, get in some insurance by going a little bit more open and a little bit more Closed. In some of the images, there's a greater degree of spatial warp between uh, tiles, and in some there's less. Is that the result of using a, like a 50 millimeter lens? She said she always used the same lens. Uh, 35? I don't remember. Oh, okay. You have to look yeah. in my book. But, um, <laughs> yeah, it's. Um, I always caution people that. Having worked with a number of artists over a number of years, what they say about their work at one point, what they did, and what they say about it later may all be three different things. But not the artists in here, I can hear them giggling in recognition. Yeah. 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 If I have my facts for you, you can confirm or deny this, but it's interesting. Jerry Yulesman, I believe, taught with her in Florida. She used to, Jerry was. Yeah, instrumental in getting her for some reason to come to Cleveland. If that's true, 
and people might want to look up Jerry Ewells, U-H-L-E-S-M-A-N, because he, in a different type of format, also changed space and time and did very abstract things. Um, it'd be interesting he, if they worked, if they once worked together, it'd be interesting if they influenced each other. Well, he taught in that region. I can't right. remember if he was at the same school. Okay, I'm not I sure. Thought. I think well, it was the person, the University of Florida. Yeah, yes, she was at a different school. She, well, she, she was in Florida. Florida. Oh, she, she was at UCF. Oh, Florida State. Florida State. Well, she went to undergrad and undergrad MFA, BFA and MFA at Florida State, but then taught at UCF, University of Central Florida. Well, the there. person she talked about as being most significant was Robert Flick, uh, okay. actually, who is detailed in the essay. And I did talk to him, and um, because of the work that he was doing, that was very influential on her. Yeah. And do we have a sense of what she told her students? Because she did have her students do um, pieces in this. Yeah, I don't know, and I'm, uh, I'd be 95% sure that it changed over the years. She also um, went and got a certificate and taught digital imaging. And what she told those students, um, and would have been actually some, that's something we did talk about, that she would have she told them very different things and very different ways to approach the image than using film. But she resolutely, for her own work, stuck with film. So um, you know, she taught for a long time. Yeah. I'm not sure what she talked about with her students changed over that period of time yeah, as photography changed enormously. Not too yeah. long before. Um, 2007, right? the students had their pieces up that mimicked this form. Right, right. I mean, you can, and that would be great to have those here, and you can see that it's like when I was in graduate school, um, I TA for a modern contemporary um, modern art course, and for the final assignment, because it drew so many art students as opposed to art history students, or in addition to art history students, instead of writing a final research paper, um, if you designated yourself an artist, you could turn in a final art project in the style of one of the artists that we had studied. And, uh, and people always thought that would be the easy out. And those were always the lowest grades. Because it seems to be easy to copy somebody's style or technique. It isn't. And they were always, everybody always gravitated toward Jackson Pollock because they thought they could do it the night before and then learn. <laughs> it never worked. So it's, it's always interesting because when somebody, um, when an artist develops a way of working and masters it, and it's a personal expression of their zeitgeist, of their view of the world, um, you know, very few people can emulate it by just using the same time. Well, what you're saying is very interesting, because I was at that super show, and there was not a piece that didn't look very crude, and um, I hope there are many people here, but, I, you know, you can see it was the style, but it's nothing like the word. Yeah. There are so many decisions. I mean, that's the thing about um, her work also is just, it, the work really starts when she gets to the place and shoots, but it really, I would say, like an iceberg, a lot of the work is sort of underwater. It comes when she's assembling the work and deciding which images to use and which prints to use and which exposures to use. And all of that is um, important to the piece and it makes a difference. But I think even in that show, the, the main difference was that uh, a lot of students said she didn't ask us to do work like, to have the same technique. She just really drilled in deep to make sure that they had good reasons for everything. That was the, what I sure. took away from that show. Yeah, I don't think she was one of those people who, like in drawing classes, often you're assigned to follow this person's sketches and that person's sketches. Yeah. I mean, I think she was very much, a, from what we talked about, a teacher who tried to elicit from people what their own needs for expression and for creation were. Right. And then just help them become more sophisticated. Uh, right. I mean, if you're teaching photo 101, of course, you're teaching the basics. <laughs> but even those assignments, there's quite a bit of variety in what people turn out. Yeah. 